So we are recording. And the purposes of us recording is we are creating a library from this 2021 Summer Crawl Workshop Series um, on all the topics. Um, and so if you don't know, these workshops are funded by the Native American Ag Fund, um, which is the leftover money from the Keeps of the Lawsuits. And so um, today we are focusing on how do I increase my profits? And our featured speaker today is my colleague, Carol Bishop. Carol, take it away. Thank you for being here today. Thank you very much, Vicki. Um, I've adapted a talk that was done by Holly Gatsky. Um, so it's mostly uh, focused toward produce, but I'd like to know um, if there's something else that you're uh, if you're doing more calves or more hay production or some other kind of production, please feel free to uh, interrupt me and ask any pertinent questions and or I, I'm more than willing to adapt. That's, that's part of uh, the joy of this is I'm adaptable and flexible. So um, I guess with no further, let me share my screen. Okay, so as I said, my name's Carol Bishop. Can you guys all see my screen? Yes? Okay. And this originally was created by uh, Holly Gatsky, who was uh, at the time my Lincoln, my uh, colleague in Lincoln County. So challenges, I hate when people just read their slides because I thought, well, you could just send me your slides and then I don't have to listen to you. So uh, as you can see, usually one owner manager, everybody, it's like, if there's just one of you, you're having to do everything. You don't have time, you don't have money. And one person can't be everything. Usually you have skills like I'm very good at numbers, but as far as marketing or the big picture, I don't get that because you're usually either a big picture person or a detail person. So for you to try to cover both by yourself, it's pretty difficult. And so this is a listing from the New York Times. Um, <laughs> math does not work. That's if you're doing the math for starters. Um, you're trying to be very, people that are going into business for themselves are very independent. So you have a hard time asking for help uh, or and or uh, listening to somebody that maybe didn't have a successful business to ask that person. Um, out of control growth, we'll talk about that a little. Um, also the lack of cash, we'll talk about some of the reasons for that. Um, dysfunctional management, that's uh, that happens a lot when, especially when if you hire somebody to help you and they don't see it the same way you do. So this is what they call the business order of needs. So this is what the, you have to do. So the first thing you're going to do is you're just going to be worrying about producing and selling your product. That's like basic because if you can't produce it, then you have nothing to sell, and if you have can't sell it, then you have no money come in. So once, once you've got past that step, then you start to get some money coming in, which is all good. And then once you get some money coming in, then you go and you say, well, how can I improve this to be able to get more money coming in to make it less work, to make it less stress? And as they said in the Harvard review, usually you only get to number two because as you grow, your businesses change. And so now I'm gonna throw this fancy chart on you. Um, and this is something that I didn't even, I'm usually at the sales and profit ends of it. I'm looking at operational expenses. I'm looking at startup expenses. Um, but as time 
I read this article and to try to understand this and I'm like, okay, I finally get it. So once your business, you've got the basics and then it starts growing a little, you do have more sales. As you can see, the sales line goes up, the profits goes up, but your cash flow goes down. It's like, wait a minute, how can I be selling more, making more money? And yet I have less in my pocket or in my bank account. And I, I found this little quote over here and from that Harvard Business Review uh, article. And where'd the money go? It's in the boxes in the warehouse and in the little pieces of paper in the front office. So what that would mean for a regular somebody with like a cattle hay business is the money's in those calves, the money's in that hay that you have put up. And the little piece of paper in the front office are all those, all those invoices that you've sent out that you haven't got paid for yet. So as your business increases, you actually sometimes have a lot less cash to work with because you've invested in inventory and you have, you've made bigger sales that you may have, or you've made a sale on a long term. Somebody's paying you monthly. So you actually can have less cash and that's normal. Okay, so I'm going to turn all of this into a, a more regular speak. Um, liquidity must be a prime objective. That basically means that you need to be able to get cash out of something easily. You need to be able to have to be able to have cash in case you needed to make a purchase for repairs, for emergencies. And so that yeah. Um, good management, know your market. So this is market research. Most small companies function best with conservative growth rates. Don't get too big for your britches. Cause if you like, I have a, I have a person here that's um, looking to buy a small farm and there's three different plots available. There's one that's six acres with a tree orchard trees on it. There's one with 11 acres with trees and also a separate building that's a processing kitchen. And then there's one that's uh, over 20 acres that has some trees on it, but also has potential to, um, our local uh, commissioner wants RV parks here. So she was thinking, okay, I can go agritourism. And she was looking at buying all three parcels. And I, I kind of put the brakes on her a little, I says, you don't know you don't have markets for all those all that fruit yet start with the six acres see if you can make that work and then build up so it's much easier if and also um organizations like banks and creditors if you start small and build they can see that okay this person's responsible they're not just jumping into something they know nothing about so you're building on that small on that small bit. So these are all the areas that we, we're going to look at throughout the rest of this talk. We're going to look at uh, how can I maximize my income, make my systems work for me, minimize my costs. And here's the one where everybody glitches on understanding income expenses and cash flow. That's where I come in. That's the details that everybody hates in the middle. But I am willing to work with anybody that needs assistance on that with creating enterprise budgets. Um, increasing the price or value of your product, uh, improve the marketing on your product, and then maximizing the production. So it's all about in with income, the best way is to make sure that you have a quality product. People are willing to pay more for a quality product. And I thought this is, cr it's, it's kind of crazy that there's, uh, I learned about something when I first started doing my economics of perceived value. And even though you may have a great product, if you have it priced too low, people perceive it as less valuable. 
And I'm going to give you the example that was given to me for this. And that's, okay, so you are looking for a hotel room to stay in. You can't go online to look at the pictures of the place. You just have uh, names and prices. You have a $30 a night hotel, you have a $60 night hotel, and you have a $90 a night hotel. So most people will pick when, if they have the funds, will pick the $90 a night motel. Why? Because there's a perceived value there that for that $90, you're going to get something that's maybe a little nicer in a better neighborhood, cleaner, better maintained. It's like, what's wrong with the $30 hotel? Now, the $30 hotel may be just as nice, but there's that perceived value of the higher price being associated with a higher quality. So make sure that you are pricing for the quality that you have. Um, look how you can see to improve by the small bit that you have. So improve your income per animal. What can you do to bring in that better breeding stock so that your cow just gets a little more weight on it or has a better appearance, has nicer marbling? Uh, what can you do to where that, that uh, grown product looks a little better? Then you have to find there's a, um, what they call economies of scale. And that's that balance between capacity and profits. Up to a certain point, uh, it doesn't matter how much you put into it, you're not able to make that pencil out. And, and a good example of that is some of the allotted land here in Nevada. Um, they have uh, 20 acre allotments. And for those uh, Native American producers trying to grow hay uh, on 20 acres, it's almost impossible to show a profit because you can't afford to buy your own equipment and you can't afford to have the work custom done. It's just too expensive. So one of the presentations that I've done in the past was to go in front of the tribal council and say, look, if we, and I sh showed by the numbers, if we can increase those allotments to, to 40 or to 60 acres, then those producers are, it's economies of scale. It's a large enough scale that they're able to make a profit. But also if you get too big, then you're beyond what you can handle and you're not using your resources to the best of your advantage. So there's that balance in there. Um, also timing. This is, uh, if you are producing and you're bringing out, uh, if you're bringing out strawberry, you're able to go strawberries in a hoop house Strawberries in February or March are going to get a much, much higher price than strawberries in June. If you're able to change your calving season to where you have calves or beef to offer when nobody else does, that's going to change your pricing. So if you're able to either go a little ahead of everybody else or have it later in the year than somebody else, then that's also an a, a way that you can increase your revenue. So production systems, if you're able to do something that your time is worth money. And so anything that you can do to reduce the amount of time that you need to do something is going to increase your profits because you have then more time to do something else to, and to work on the business itself. And this is a lot, I know most of us probably are not able to have employees. Um, so the staff time and engaged employee, but look at this, you're your own staff. And you also have to remember uh, on number five, I'm gonna say, especially for those with, with small businesses, you need to take some, figure out how to take some time out for yourself, because if you don't, 
rejuvenate. You are not going to be a happy, engaged employee. You're not going to be working at your full potential. You're going to be stressed out and you're not going to have an efficient business. Um, okay. Minimizing costs, refining your production systems to reduce labor. If there's something that you can do to make your own work more efficient, somehow, okay, I've got to go out and do this. Well, this is also in the same area. Let me do this and this while I'm out there. I got to go out and I've got to uh, vaccinate these animals. Let me go ahead and do a little fence fix while I'm out there in that remote area. If I've got to be in there uh, weeding the hoop house, let me go ahead and after I'm done weeding, do my spray at the same time. So I'm doing my doing my timing to where it's most efficient use of my time. Um, I'm not even sure what cloud services are. <laughs> so it says explore new cloud services. Um, I don't know that for those of us in the outlying areas that the um, some of the internet things are as great. I would always say I'm a sort of a paper person, so I would always like to have some sort of some sort of backup, but at least a uh, backup. Um, change your folder cell. Maybe you can bundle <laughs> to get to get those costs down, and then strategic tax planning you your tax person should be like your plumber you should know who they are they should always have your best interests at heart and you should have a relationship with them i would consult your tax person before you make any kind of major changes to see what potential impacts those may have on your income um, because if you can reduce there's so many ways right now that you can reduce your taxes to almost nothing, but some of them are quite attractive, but may not pay off in the end. That's something like a, um, like a 179 deduction. Right now you can buy a piece of equipment and you can write up to $500,000 off. I believe that's what the 179 deduction is this year in the first year. However, if you don't have $500,000 $500, worth of income, uh, it doesn't make sense to reduce it beyond that. Plus, you don't get that tax break then in years. And so instead of depreciating that equipment over 10 years like you would normally and take $50,000 a year off your income, if you take that whole big chunk off, well, it's great this year, but then next year you get slammed. So before major purchases or major financial decisions, um, figure out what the tax implications would be, either through uh, yourself or through your tax professional. And there's a lot of help online with that um, at various sources that we can refer you to for taxes, because I know that that scares a lot of people. Um, so, According to Forbes, it, it says it can pay more to cut overhead than to boost sales. So uh, it's also easier to control. It's easier to control what you spend and, and your actions than it is to try to get in new customers because that's dependent on, sales is dependent on others. Your costs are dependent on you. So it's easier to cut, it's easier to control cutting your costs than it is to control increasing sales. Um, you got to stick to your own budget. Otherwise, what's the point? Um, they have like ensure a simple system is in place to purchase from preferred suppliers on deal rather than ad hoc buys. Um, I compare this to uh, my sister taught me this lesson about clothes shopping. She said, because I used to like buy my clothes at discount stores. Like, <clears throat> so I could, I name names like Walmart and other. <laughs> and she said, it's actually cheaper to go to a high quality store like Macy's and buy off the clearance rack 
than it is to buy at Walmart. I said, you're crazy. And then I started doing it and I thought, hmm, the clothes last longer and they are as, ex as inexpensive or less sometimes because they're not in fashion anymore. So if you have a preferred supplier, it's better to go to them for that deal because they like, just like you, they don't want to have to make the extra effort in marketing and sales. So if you can go to one of your suppliers and say, look, I'm looking at getting this um, out here. I, if I buy it from this guy, I can get it from there, but I'd much rather buy it from you. What kind of deal can you work for me? And if you do that consistently, especially with su suppliers that you have a relationship with and can trust, that can work a lot better than buying uh, the cheapest new thing that may or may not be delivered on time and that may or may not suit your needs. Um, lost receipts. Worst case scenario, have at least a shopping bag or a box or just something that every receipt that you have, you throw that bad boy in there because it's those nickel and dime things that really, really add up. Because all of you know this, once you break a $100 bill, and if unless you spend it on one purchase, it's like, I can ask you, where'd that $100 go? And you're like, mm, you can probably recall two or three things that you might have got with it, but you won't recall three or four others. And so it's always keep all your receipts and put that all in for your bookkeeping person, especially if that's you. Um, increasing sales, they can, if you have a fixed cost per unit, if you can increase sales, that will minimize how much you have to pay for that particular item. Okay, so this is, this is my little detail special. Um, you know, you need to know how much you're making. If you don't know what your cost of an item is, then you can't actually market it well either um this came up when i was learning about organic produce to actually know that this people say five dollars for that peach wow well that peach costs me because of the way i take care of it and the packaging uh four dollars and ten cents to produce and if you can tell the buyer that, then that buyer feels much better about buying that $5 peach. It's not that, and you can then, if you know what your exact costs are on each thing or each enterprise that you do, you can then say, okay, I can either do a $10, I can either do a, a specific cost margin to price, or I can say that's a fair price because I know it costs me this much to do. You don't have to wonder, am I pricing correctly? Um, cash flow projection each month, know your budget, find other ways that you can make money from the same thing that you're already doing. Um, work numbers, you have to be able to cover your costs. If you're not covering your costs and making money, then you're not going to be able to continue to do it. And that cash cushion for downturns, that's once again coming back to the first part of our talk about liquidity. Okay, is everybody still awake? <laughs> all right. Okay, all right, here we go. This is an example of costs and returns. Uh, this is for a hoop house who, as you can see, they're selling tomatoes and squash blossoms and mustard. So this is their total income. So the first three things, the tomatoes, squash, and blossoms are their summer crops. And they know exactly how much per square foot it, revenue they get from those, as well as how much it costs. So while my operator later, labor costs $6.28 cents a square foot, I all my winter crops added together don't come to six dollars. Oh, maybe close, two, four, just a little bit over. So I'm making no money in the winter, really, but those summer crops 
are the big bumper to carry you through. Then down here, Real, is, yes. You can make 50 cents per squash blossom? Yes. Holy cats. Now this, I, I, I have to, um, <laughs> I have to preface this by this hoop house is in link was in Lincoln County and these squash blossoms were getting sold in the little fancy uh, clamshell containers to chefs in Vegas who dip fry them uh, dip them in batter and fry them and sell them in their fancy dancy restaurants for like five dollars a piece or some crazy thing like that, yes. But as you can see, without the squash blossoms, this budget would not have would not have gone because with all the costs, including what I have to pay to re, uh, replace my equipment, after I pay myself, I'm only making fifteen dollars for the whole year. So that's the trick is to know what you have so you know what you have to add. Who would have known that without those squash blossoms, I'd be in the red. So this is the sort of thing that you need to do for each enterprise that you have. If you don't have an enterprise budget, I'd be glad to assist you with setting up one. This is, this is the details I love. This is an example of that monthly summary of expenses, because as you can see, they're selling those in June and July. They're selling the greens in the early spring. And so there's going to be some months like uh, July where woohoo, we're in the black, we're $1,000 to the good. And then December, nothing's getting grown. So you're 700 in the hole because you still have your expenses. So this is lets you know, and banks also like these because if they want to, or FSA, if they want to give you an operating loan, they need to know this because this tells them, okay, I will loan you, it's October, I'll loan you the money, but I can't expect to get paid back on this until July. And it lets you know and it lets the bank know. Plus, it's just good to know which of those months that you're going to need that extra liquidity we were talking about. So <clears throat> increasing the price. Um, you can buy something from anybody. I, I, food, things are so, unless your product is really, really unique, it's the story. People buy from you because of who you are and the values that you or your company stand for and your story. They want to know, especially in today's market, know your farmer, know your food. They want to know why you're doing what you're doing and if they should spend their money with you. So, your story is very important and how you tell your story and how you present it in marketing. Um, be unique, do something to stand out because what makes you, you, uh, and customer service. I, I can go anywhere to eat, uh, like I, an hour away is Vegas for me. I have lots of choices and I won't go to somewhere with cruddy customer service because I can buy something somewhere else. And so quality customer service and telling your story, that's how you can increase your price and your value of your product. And people see the value in your product. If they know that you are putting back into the land they're willing to pay that extra bit. Most people, the people with that have the money to to make the decision on where to purchase are willing to pay that extra. Now, there's always going to be those people that they just have because of their financial situation. And I was one of these for 40 years. 
that I just had to get the cheapest thing possible because that's all I could afford. However, the most of the buying public has, has some level of choice. And so if you have that higher value product and you present it as that because you are doing something that is unique, that's, that's where your market, you can improve your value of your product. This is kind of, this, so the cost to make market and transport, that's all under your control. Your expected return goes into your price. Um, competitors quality, now you can, if you're trying to compete with major suppliers, if I'm growing tomatoes, I'm not going to grow a common tomato because then I'm competing with Walmart market, okay, or the local supermarket. I want to have something that's unique, so I'm going to grow an heirloom. I'm going to sell something that my competitors can't offer for a lower price or Okay. Improved marketing, multiple market and sales options. If you're relying on one source for all your sales, that's just scary. Um, have plan B and C. And this is, like I said, this talk is uh, geared toward produce. So uh, if it doesn't meet prime market, then you need to have a backup plan. Generational preferences. I don't like the same things that my 34 year old son likes. He recently moved in with me and I am finding this. So the things that he will buy, even food wise are quite different than what I buy. He wants quick, easy microwave. Okay, I want something completely different. I don't know if there's trends like that with hay, uh, possibly, you know, whatever the new, you know, oh, my horse will eat nothing but Timothy. <laughs> so, you know, whereas the, whereas the good old guy's like, nope, he gets pastured alfalfa and that's what he gets. So- Well, no, and that's a really good point because you have dairy quality hay and then you have like grass mixes. In South Dakota, we have um, what we call not clean hay where Stacy raises clean hay. Clean hay means no, no weeds in it. And so that's almost uncommon up here. So you're right, it, it, there is a thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, if there's some way that you can partner with somebody to do what you're doing um, and it's somebody that works well and compliments your business. I say, go for it. If like, like you said, somebody has uh, the clean hay and somebody else has the, the dirty hay to be able to offer more choices. If, and if you guys were like next to each other, neighbors, uh, buddy up, get a truck so that people have choices. So this is for if you're doing produce. So the unsold, not quite, create something else with that product. If it's horrible or not so great, then figure out some other use for it where you're not just dumping it in the trash and there's alternatives. Ah, social media, yes. Um, Facebook sells so much stuff, uh, out here. I don't know. Uh, you guys are probably in all pretty much rural areas as well. And that's the lifeblood for here. I know we, uh, in our small town uh, or small Valley of about 6,000, we have one, we have about five different Facebook sites that I can think of. We have the online area market. We have the online area market with less stringent rules. We have like uh, farm and garden uh, sales. We, you know, so there's numerous outlets. Um, 
And even if you're not necessarily selling on Facebook, um, you can still get people talking about your business on Facebook or other social media. And I say Facebook because that's the one I'm familiar with. I don't tweet. Um, <laughs> so I've not used that before. So maybe that's uh, another talk that we might consider having is uh, just a social, social media marketing thing. I don't know how to, I don't know how to sell on Twitter. I don't know if you do, but <laughs> there's a Paul possibility for that. Um, I would say also to not have, if you're going to have a website, have a good one. I would rather somebody not have a website and I just contact them through Facebook Messenger rather than having a website that doesn't interact or it's like I go on it and I can't tell are these people still in business or not because or have it work poorly. I'm trying to order something uh, and it won't work. I rather not have it at all. I'd rather have a phone number I can call than have a poor website. Um, word of mouth, referrals and testimonials. Uh, we had we had a vendor come in. We had a guy come in to the valley uh, with a bunch of fruit and just parked up at the local gas station selling um, strawberries out of somewhere. And it was like, eh, I can get strawberries down at the market. But the people that were commenting on it were like, OMG, you have to taste these strawberries. These are so good. And so it's like, hmm, okay. I'll drive up to the gas station, check out these dudes' strawberries. And they were different. So uh, referrals and testimonials, because people uh, know that you're trying to sell something. So you have a vested interest in saying that your product's quality. Whereas your customers, that will, uh, people looking at you for the first time have a tendency to trust your customer's opinion more than yours. And digital marketing, advertising, and landing pages. I'm not sure what a landing page is, but I'm sure it's probably one of those direct you to something else, something. So that's something that uh, I'd like to explore more. So increased production per foot, row, acre, animal. You tell that chicken if she isn't laying production. <laughs> <laughs> I need an egg a day from you, little lady, or else. Yeah. So, <laughs> what can, then what can you do to, is it worth it to add additional fertilizers uh, to increase the amount of production you have? That's one of those questions where you have to go back again to this guy and say, okay, if I put more fertilizer on, what can I then raise this cost per price to, to still break even? So there's things that you can do, of course, but you always have to then see, does it make monetary sense for me? So focus effort and crops providing the greatest return in prime market. That's not always the case. Um, I did a enterprise budget for a person and they had a mixed uh, crop of different produce. And so we did like we did before and the garlic, garlic was nine worth $9 a row foot, which is crazy. And I said, well, you could totally make a whole lot more money if you put your whole acre and a half into garlic. But that was not what they wanted to do because money making was not their primary concern. They wanted to feed families wholesome food year round. And so while they took a hit on their potential profit, their business vision of what they wanted to do with their business was more important to them than just the monetary factors. So I know this says focus on the primary, but you need to know 
have something that fits in line with your mission and your vision for your business, who you are. Um, have a plan for calls. Uh, produce, it's 20 to 60%. So thankfully, uh, uh, that it's not the case with animal pr production. But once again, you can have that kind of problem with uh, infestations in hay crops, as I just found out about from Vicki this morning. Um, so if everything goes bad, then what do you do with it? Okay. Uh, you sell it as uh, like bad hay around here. We have a bunch of people that buy hay uh, once, once and twice a year, not to feed to their animals, but for the hay mazes and for growing in bales. So if you have an alternative, that's once again, that BC, uh, have a plan B and a plan C. So what else can I do if things go horribly wrong with that hay and it's not, okay, if it's really bad, okay, then we can feed it to cows instead of horses. And if it goes really, really bad, then we can just bale it and use it for, uh, I guess it would be called ornamental, you know, sitting around outside the shop. So with produce, 20 to 50 percent of it, they said, is too low of quality for fresh sales to the consumer. We have gotten so stinking picky. Um, this saves me a whole bunch of money, though. We have um, a chain of uh, Mexican supermarkets in Vegas called Mariana's. I always go to them for my produce because it's about half the price that it is in the regular grocery stores because they don't care about different sizes like they want the apples or the or the limes especially they won't be all uniform size there'll be some that are huge some that are small the quality's there but the size is different but i don't care if i'm mixing a five inch diameter lime with a two inch diameter lime if i'm only paying half the price and i just care about the juice inside um, disease or in, in, insect damage, so it looks horrible. Um, immature, overmature, all these things, that's all like money down the drain. So here's some things that you can do for cult uh, produce. Sell it for food processing, donate it to the farm, let it go to seed, use it as feed for your livestock, till it under, and I know that Vicky's really glad she didn't have to do that with her hay. Um, <laughs> or at worst, worst scenario, compost it. Um, you can, if you have something go horribly wrong that it that's not that you don't sell, but it's good quality. Donate it to a food bank, donate it to somebody. Worst case scenario, you get a bit of a tax break. Um, is there anybody on the call that is doing produce sales? No? Okay. No, but Carol, I think that there's been a lot of interest recently in the ugly fruits and vegetables movement. You know, people <laughs> now think that that's the cool thing to buy. And so I think there's a whole market for ugly vegetables fruits and vegetables that don't fit the mainstream. <laughs> All right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I've heard that there's like a home delivery, like subscription too, that they take the imperfects and mail them out to you. And, you know, it makes people feel good that they're not going to waste and, you know, all the waste that there used to be. Yeah. It's really interesting, actually. I haven't done it yet, but I think it's a fascinating concept. There's a market for it. Excellent. <laughs> So um, if you can then reprocess some of those things, that's going to give you higher revenue than, than your other choices. Uh, you, at this point, have to decide, do you want to do this or do you want to sell it off to somebody else that's doing it? Once again, you got to value your time. While, uh, so for myself, if I was to have a produce operation, I am woefully ignorant on canning 
And so the, the learning curve that it would take me to do that value added jam or jelly would not be worth the time because it would not be quality by first, uh, probably my first many batches uh, to make it worth my while. So I'd be better off just selling it to somebody else. But if you have a background to that or you know what you're doing, it's all about choices. No, and so for Nevada, uh, this is the the steps for uh, doing cottage food law, but it's a very select group of things. So if you're interested in that, I can give you more information. Um, so this and this is kind of a little flow chart that goes along with that. It's like, okay, can you do this, that, this? And so uh, you can't have more than $35,000 in gross sales in cottage foods. Well, if you're selling $35,000 worth of stuff you're making yourself, more power to you. Um, then there's also the craft food law. So this is for vegetables more than produce because this is anything pickled. So, and that's with uh, Nevada Department of Ag, which is a less strict governing authority. And that's the other thing is to know, know who your authorities are for the people that are, uh, that are related to your business. If you do, uh, if you do cow sales, having your brand, having a relationship with your brand inspector, having a relationship with that salesperson. It's once again, it comes down to those relationships. It's just not as well as the service end of things. Get to know those people that are involved with the sales chain of whatever your uh, product is and develop genuine relationships with those people if possible. That makes, that opens up the doors for lots of opportunities because if you're friends with them and there's gonna be a big thing say, hey, there's a big buyer coming in, blah, blah, blah. Or if they have a shortage on their load and they say, hey, uh, we need like 20 more cows to fill this load. Can, uh, can, you, can you provide those for us? They'll call, if you have that relationship with that person, they'll call you first, they'll think of you. And those relationships um, can make or break. Um, it says here, now there's certain things that you can produce commercially that are the baked goods, the dried products, those are under the cottage food law, canned products that are acidified, that's the craft law, and then it kind of gets more difficult, cut and packaged fruit, processed items, fermented food, and refrigerated products. Those are all, you have to have a processing license, but that's becoming very popular here um i know so i'm thinking probably in other areas too is that i as a grower will send my stuff uh we have a, a new person that just sent their stuff off to a processor in vegas and to uh have them do the processing so it's all legit with the uh, southern nevada health district and now it's coming back to our local stores as blah 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 salsa so they they have the 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 product they have the recipe they send it to the processor the processor packages it and they deal with all the laws and sometimes that's worth the extra money depending on how much once again how much your time's worth and where do you you should be focusing your time on the things that you do best and hiring out or allocating those things that are not your strengths to somebody else who that is their strength yeah, if you're you're not a social media marketer, get your teenager to do it. Um, this is 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 the value added pro profitable. So once again, you have to go back to our lovely Excel spreadsheets, figure it all out before you do it. It's much easier to make a mistake on paper than it is to make a mistake in real life. Um, because paper, you're like, oh, that doesn't seem like a good idea, rather than you're all the way up to your elbows in it. Uh, farm to fork, this is kind of a cool thing. I don't know if in other states they have that, this, but you can have up to two events a month. 
where, but this means that you have to be willing to deal with people. Um, if I'm on a, if I'm on a farm and I'm out in the middle of nowhere, I don't want to be dealing with people in the first place, but so this is one of those things where it's doable and it, you can uh, use even your chickens, rabbits, and other uh, small game that you've grown. Uh, you can slaughter that and sell that as this part of this farm to fork event. You can't do beef or pork, but you can do those other small animals. And so this would give you a chance. It's like, okay, all my stuff hasn't sold. I'm going to do or it's not selling well, do two of these a month and to help to get rid of some of that excess stock. Um, seeds. Uh, if you're growing something that is not a hybrid and is, doesn't have any kind that could be considered um, natural, native, and or heritage, uh, the seeds may be uh, almost as much value as a value-added crop or because so many seeds are now non-reproducing because they're specialized, they're GMO, they're hybrid, that there is a, a yearning for these types of products because people want to be able to grow their own and they want to be able to reproduce those from seeds. So there's some uh, resources for you on seeds saving from uh, plant. Um, produce. Yeah, if it's, if it's bad, it's, uh, it's not only ugly, but maybe a little too green, a little overripe. Uh, turn it into something that's going to get eaten eventually. <laughs> and that'll, that, I mean, you could even, you could even, uh, yeah, there's a lot of ways you can uh, get creative with this. Uh, we have, like, we just did a, we have a big opuntia or a prickly pear uh, experiment about back. And now that the grant period is over, my horticulturalist is using the trimming we're keeping trying to keep the uh, paths between the plantings clear so all that prickly pear is getting cut off by her kids and thrown in the back of her truck and she feeds it to her cattle so she's saving a behind ton of money not having to feed and or they use less water because of the water content of the of the prickly pear so she's reduced significantly reduced her costs by tapping into a free resource. So this might even be something that you might consider if you have livestock is find out if you have a, a, a produce producer nearby that uh, regularly has to compost or get rid of some of their product. Uh, green manure. Um, now, Vicki, with the, the problem that you were telling me about this morning, if it was as bad as, if it was infested your whole field, would you have been able to dig that in? So it's a stand of alfalfa, and so we would have had to just, um, just not hay it. We have uh, blister beetles, which in South Dakota is just almost non-existent. We called our NRCS this morning, and they had no idea. The only reason I knew is social media and a gal in a couple counties over was like just put hanging equipment away. And so with blister beetles, they are toxic whether they're alive or dead. And ah. so um, the big thing on that is even next year, we're going to have to watch them. And if they're dead on the ground or, you know, make sure we get a really good solid freeze some decomposition happening and that type of thing. So it's more than just this year, it'll go to next year. Okay, so live or dead, so you couldn't have even tilled that in and had it be good. I mean, we could, but like with a stand of alfalfa, you're usually four to five years and we have a couple more years on it. So um, we did learn later though, that like we, we could spray it 
and then the dead bugs will fall down and then like our bather won't pick it up, pick up the dead bugs. However, this year the grasshoppers are also so bad and that's why we have these blister beetles because they eat the larvae of the grasshoppers. So oh. we don't have enough to spray again because we've already sprayed for weevils. So we're just gonna knock it down, get it dry. The blister beetles will then leave and we'll hay it and see what we end up with. The biggest thing is keeping it away from horse hay because horses are much more susceptible to these toxins, so. Okay, so I guess that's an option sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Not always. Uh, and here, once again, compost. Now the compost may have, I don't think would kill, kill the chemicals in the beetles either. So there is something, so especially with plant diseases, I mean, but that's the that's is the last last resort. So once again, we've talked about how to maximize your income. Any any uh, labor or systems that you have in place, taking your costs down because that's the easiest to do. Knowing about your income expenses and cash flow with those enterprise budgets. Remember, I'm willing to assist anybody with that. Um, increasing your value by telling your story and or having a product that's unique and stands out. Uh, improve your marketing by uh, telling your story and allowing your customers to tell people how amazing you are. And then maximizing production by uh, and making sure that that maximized production is not costing you the extra revenue that's involved. All right. Let's see where do I... uh, okay. Um stop sharing. Excellent. Somewhere. Nice timing, Carol. Thank so you. we are at 1203. And so do we have any questions? Comments? Okay. I talked for an hour. You did great. Yes. <laughs> Guys, I'm going to stop share or stop recording for our library and then we can talk freely. Okay, there we go.